beside the ocean. Leave the fire behind. <laughs> This happened in 2021, in the middle of summer at Myrtle Beach. Me and my boyfriend had just got a suite on the beach to celebrate our four year anniversary. We had walked to the beach until around 11 p.m. when we decided to go back to our room since my boyfriend's stomach was bothering him. We get back to the room and he decides to lay down. I decided to go on the balcony and watch the ocean under the night sky. Our hotel room was between the fifth to eighth floor and the beach was completely lit up for miles both ways. A lot of teenagers were on the beach, directly below me, partying and shooting fireworks. I watched, entertained, while they shot a huge firework into the sky. Suddenly, without thinking, my eyes instinctively landed on a man who was standing behind the boys. I saw this man so clearly. He was a black middle-aged man, wearing a white t-shirt and dark shorts. He was clearly distressed and without hesitation the man does a 180 and starts running down the beach, away from where the fireworks were being shot. As this man got further away, I watched his body begin to vanish. I could literally see the beach through his body when finally the faintest glow outlined his body and he completely disappeared. My body froze and I tried calming myself as I made my way to my boyfriend, trying to not freak out about what I just saw. For the rest of the night, we both heard a lot of weird noises. It started with the toilet seat in our bathroom being slammed down and the dishes in our cabinets being rattled. We both heard noises and barely got any sleep the entire night. This is a true story and happened several years ago. I remembered it was a good friend's birthday. Me and a group of other friends decided to celebrate it by drinking at Sentosa late at night, around 3 a.m. Since it was a weekday, the beach was empty. We were relaxing on the beach when the birthday girl suddenly stood up, ran to the sea, and started shouting vulgarities. Thinking it was a joke, we decided to ignore her. But something weird happened. When she was knee deep in the water, she faced us, but her eyes stared into nothingness and started laughing hysterically. Like those Pontianaks or ghosts in the movies. So anyway, we know something was amiss and ran to get her out of the sea before she did anything stupid. Just as she left the water, she collapsed and started mumbling something inaudible. This was when we knew something was up and decided to leave ASAP. Me and the other guy who got her out of the water were in charge of keeping a close eye on her while the others started packing up. The girl suddenly stood up and started dancing like those in the Kuda camping group. We tried to stop her but couldn't. It was as if she gained some superhuman strength. We didn't know what to do. She started waving her hands as if gesturing, something to join her dance. I use the word something loosely here because she was gesturing towards the nearby forest. Fortunately, a Malay man was walking by when the commotion was taking place. He started reading some Quranic verses and she collapsed again, but this time unconscious. We thanked the guy, took our things and ran to the main road to flag for a taxi. Another girl offered to take the birthday girl to sleep at her house. The next day, the girl had no memory whatsoever about anything the day before. We informed the parents and the parents took her to a bomo. The bomo did some rituals and gave her a talisman to wear, but did not explain much. To this day, we still have no idea what went wrong, but she is still wearing the talisman. So this happened when I was around 9 or 10. I'm from Australia. 
Growing up, my dad decided to move to the Mornington Peninsula, Victoria. So that meant every second weekend in summer when I went to stay with him, we went to the beach. Being on a peninsula, there were so many beaches to choose from. We were never starved for choices. Not sure how the decision was made, I think it was mainly dependent on how tired my stepmom was. Me and my cousin's favorite beach was a back beach that had really big waves. Not big enough to be popular with surfers, but big enough for us to bodyboard. I can't really remember the name of the beach. It was over 30 years ago. But I want to say Sorrento Back Beach. I know it definitely started with an S, but I'm not sure if it was as far as Sorrento. It was a super hot day in the summer vacation. I was staying at my dad's for the week with my cousin. Somehow we convinced my stepmom to take us to our favorite beach. I didn't get why she didn't like this beach much when I was a kid, but thinking back to it now as an adult, I do. It was always full of the roundiest kids and the water was too rough to enjoy a leisurely swim. My cousin had boogie boards but didn't bring them that vacation. So me and him resorted to body surfing, which is just riding the waves with our body and no board or equipment. We actually did this a lot since one of the two boards was his sister's and she didn't always let us bring hers for me to use. We were in the water with a mass of other kids, all riding the waves back to the shore as best we could on our chests. I was hiking back out after a huge wave when another wave came towards us. I wasn't out deep enough and it wasn't anything special so I chose to just jump over it. It was actually bigger than I thought it was, so I was up to my nose in the water. Then, something weird happened. Where I was in the water, I wasn't really too close to anyone else. But when I jumped, and the water lifted me up, my right foot connected with something. Something round, covered in something that felt like hair and distinctly head-like. I don't know how, but I knew this was a head. It was also weirdly cold and clammy. As I said, there wasn't anyone close to me before the wave hit or around me after. Terror swept through me and I took off towards the shore. I looked back several times but never saw anyone come up again and actually saw other kids go to that spot. Might not seem that scary to just hear this, but imagine being a kid, feeling this, and never seeing the reason for it. I tried thinking of possibilities, but could come up with nothing. So what was it my foot connected with that summer day? A dead body? A kid pulled under, who just happened to be where my foot was. A prankster? If it was a prankster, surely they would have laughed about it with their friends, but I saw no one submerge. Also, why was it so cold? If it was a dead body, the beach would have been closed, but it wasn't. I never heard about it on the news either. I was never keen to go back to that beach, but never told anyone why. Anytime we did go there, I just made sure to never go out too deep. This is a story about when my good friends got together and went to the beach in the summer. At first, I was having fun on the beach, but one of my friends suddenly said to us, hey, let's jump down from there, pointing to a small cliff. It's a good place to jump in and play. It wasn't very high, but when I was little, I never had the courage to jump in. We had come to the sea for the first time in a long time, and we were all excited and immediately started running to the cliff. One of my friends brought a camera with him this day, so we all took an interesting pose to make memories, took a picture of the moment of jumping in and played for a while. Aha, huh? Noriko, where did you go? One person said. I can't find Noriko anywhere I look. We all searched around the beach, but we could not find her. So we talked to the watchman's older brother and looked for her together, but we still couldn't find her. Everyone was thinking the worst. Maybe in the sea. Eventually the sun went down and everyone went home with the assurance of the watchman who told us, I'll continue to search as best I can, so go home. 
It was about a week later that Noriko was found. Unfortunately, I had a bad feeling that this would be the outcome. Noriko seemed to have drowned in the sea. We were all upset of course, but we thought at least we can give Noriko's family a picture of her having fun in the sea. Her last memory, a happy one. However, the owner of the photo, Yutaka, was not very enthusiastic. When I questioned him, he said that there was something strange with that picture. We were shocked by Yutaka's attitude, and we didn't want to talk to him much, so eventually he just tells us to come and see the picture for ourselves. In the picture, there was everyone who seemed to be having fun, and of course, Noriko. What's the problem? It's a good picture. Watch until the end, Yutaka replied. The last picture that came out was one of the moment when Noriko jumped into the sea in a playful pose. Behind him, many white hands extending from the sea were clearly reflected. This happened in the summer of 2018. At that time my friends and I liked to go to the beach at night to get some relief from the summer heat. We didn't really have air conditioning at home and inside tended to get stuffy. But since we were close to the ocean there was always a breeze at night. It was a super hot day with very little wind. My friend, Mark, called me up to go to the beach for a couple of beers and to cool down. It was so hot that I agreed straight away without giving it much thought. He tried getting two of my other friends to join us, but they said they were busy, so it was just the two of us. Now, we didn't live too far from a beach, but Mark said he had gone to one a little further up from the one we usually went to, and it was a good time, so we decided to go there. We loaded up our backpacks and jumped on our bikes, better to not drink and drive. We rode for around 25 to 30 minutes, and then we were there. The beach was a bit more secluded than our usual, with a slight overhang and steps leading down. There were no benches or anything, it was a less popular beach after all, so we just sat on the sand and cracked open a beer each. Mark said our friend Jay decided that he would come down after work in about 45 minutes or so. He was also bringing some more beer and some weed so it sounded like it was going to be a good night. We settled in, drinking and shooting the shit. The night was clear with an almost full moon and no clouds. The cool ocean breeze felt good. It was a perfect night. After about 20 minutes, Jay said he saw someone on the beach to our left, about a mile away. He pointed in the direction and sure enough, there was what appeared to be a man by the shape of his body. They were just standing there facing our direction, not moving but clearly facing us. Ah, oh, Jay must be early, Mark said. Yeah, but what's wrong with him? I replied. Maybe he's just trying to see if it's us. You know how he can be paranoid sometimes. Yeah, true, I said, waving at him. Hey! The voice travelled across the beach from the figure's direction. The weird thing was that it sounded closer than it should have been, while being distant at the same time. Come over, Jay. We're here, Mark yelled out. The figure stood there unmoving. Hey. Again, close but far. This time, I started feeling a little uneasy. Mark, I don't think it's Jay, I said. Yeah, Mark murmured. Hey. The voice was getting more drawn out and distorted each time. Was it closer to us? I couldn't quite tell in the low light. Then suddenly the figure just seemed to gradually fade away. What the hell? Mark said in a small voice, visibly shaken. We should leave, I said. Hey. This time it was behind us, but right in my ear at the same time. That was it. We grabbed what we could and ran to our bikes. The fear we felt was so primal, I've never been so scared in my life, and from his expression, I'm sure Mark felt the same way. We rode the whole way home in silence before we stopped to calm down. 
It was then that I remembered Jay and gave him a call. He was halfway there and I told him to just come to my place without explaining. When he arrived, we explained the story to him and he kind of just laughed it off but looked a little creeped out. I don't know what we experienced that day but I was never comfortable going to the beach at night again and we never went back to that particular beach. This is a story about when I went to the beach. On that day, I went to the beach with my friends, Tanaka and Sato. We didn't have an exact plan on where to go, but we just drove around until we found a nice sandy beach. Hey, isn't this place good? I said. Idiot. It's very crowded. It's better to have more space. While driving and talking back and forth to each other, I found a sandy beach mixed with rocky areas a little ways off from the crowded beach. There were almost no people there, and we liked the atmosphere. It looked like a secret place, so we decided to stop the car and stay there. Before entering the sea, we inflated our floating rings and float mats that we had brought along with us. To be honest, I'm not very good at swimming, and the floating ring is my lifeline. Playing in the water itself was quite fun. The sea without all the people is comfortable and the weather was nice and clear. It was a perfect day for swimming playing with a beach ball, or just drifting around on the water on a float mat. While we were enjoying the water, Tanaka said he was going to the bathroom. If you're going to take a piss, you can do it here. Shut up, I saw a toilet on the beach over there, so I'm going over there for a while. After seeing Tanaka off, I also felt like taking a break, so I lay down on the float mat I put on the edge of the beach. I thought it must have been at least 10 minutes since Tanaka had left. I was just beginning to get a little sleepy laying on the mat when I heard a voice calling people from the sea. This woke me up. Oi! I looked around to see where the voice was coming from, and I saw a figure that looked like Sato, waving to me a little offshore. Oi! What? Did something happen? Oi! I called out to him, but I thought maybe he couldn't hear me. He was just waving his hand towards me curiosity began to get the better of me, so I rode the float mat out to where Sato is. Oi! What are you doing? You can't swim well. Oi! I call out while getting closer, but no matter what I say, the other side just repeats. Oi! The hell is this, I was wondering. But then, I began to notice. What? Who is that guy? I thought it was Sato because of the similar height, but when I looked closely, it was a completely different person. And more concerningly, this individual doesn't even have a floating ring, where Sato, who has even less swimming ability than I do, can't come out to a place this deep without a floating ring. This man, he had stopped calling to me now, and he just stared at me with no expression. I was so scared. I hurriedly turned around and tried to get back to the sandy beach. However, the tide flows quickly. No matter how much I push the float mat, I can't get back to the shore. It is too strong. While I was struggling, something grabs my right ankle. I was dragged into the sea with a tremendous force, and although I struggled desperately, my hands slipped away from the float mat. No, I'm going to die. Help me. In my struggles, my lungs were taking in water, and I couldn't take it much longer. Just when I thought it was all over for me, I was saved by a surfer who happened to be nearby. A few seconds longer, and I would have been a goner. I was pulled up onto the surfer's board, and he took me back to the sandy beach while I still struggled to breathe. Tanaka and Sato looked surprised, and rushed to my side when I got up from the sea. Hey, are you okay? They turned to the surfer. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but thank you for helping our friend. No, I'm glad I noticed it early. It's just... What? What happened? The surfer answered Tanaka's words. You'd better stop swimming here. I saw it when I was trying to pull him onto my board. There was a man hanging onto his foot from the water. That's... That's probably not human. 
on my right ankle, there was a bruise in the shape of a human hand. According to what I had heard later, that place is prohibited from swimming because there are many remote streams, and it is a place where local people never swim. Even now, when I hear a voice calling, Oi! I remember the immense fear I felt at that time. This happened to me on the Gold Coast, Australia. It was around 2003, I believe. My family and I were visiting one of the many beautiful beaches for the day, and at the time were quite avid open water swimmers. As the beach was very busy that day, we wandered a little further south and found a nice, quiet spot. It was a little ways back from the beach itself. The water flowed via a narrow stream from the ocean and opened into a very deep inlet. We spent a few hours paddling on the shoreline and enjoying the peace and quiet. Perhaps we should have stopped to wonder why we were the only ones enjoying this particular swimming spot. After a while, we stopped for some lunch and after finishing a nice feed, we returned to the water again. My mother and I, being quite the fitness fanatics at the time, decided we would challenge each other to a race across the inlet. So off we went. About halfway across, I started feeling kind of wrong. I can't explain what it was that I felt in that moment. It wasn't fear. It wasn't panic. I just felt like I needed to get to that shoreline. I'm not sure if my mother felt the same thing or if she was just taking our race a little too seriously, but her pace quickened too. When we got to the other side, we climbed up onto the shoreline, ready to start the walk around to where we left the rest of our family. We were walking, talking, laughing, when suddenly my mother fell silent and her gaze fixed upon something up ahead. I followed her gaze and noticed a sign that had not been visible from the other side where we had been swimming. I felt my body tense up as I read the sign. Bull sharks inhabit this inlet. Swimming strictly prohibited. A cold fear washed over me. For those of you unaware, bull sharks are among the most aggressive species of shark. Most sharks will stay away from you, being very shy creatures by nature. Bull sharks, however, are extremely territorial and are far more likely to rip you apart entirely unprovoked. Two weeks later, I read in the paper that an 80 year old man was killed in a bull shark attack, swimming in that exact same spot. It haunts me to this day, thinking back to that moment, thinking how easily that death could have been us, thinking how probable it is that it was almost us, the two of us flailing atop deep dark water. Dozens of pairs of beady black eyes staring up at us, any one of them ready and waiting to grab us without a second's hesitation and drag us down into the depths. Looking back, I cannot believe that we actually went out there. Yet, there we were, helpless, exposed and vulnerable, without a clue in the world. Absolutely no idea what was down there. Watch out when you go to East Coast Park for chalet or barbecue, because this could happen to you. I don't know whether this really happens or not, but it was told to me by a friend of mine, Izad. Since I got a computer and stuff, he hopes that I can pass his story on to people out there and make it known to them that there are such things in this world. This is the true life account of my friend's close brush with death. According to him, the story took place during his picnic trip with his family members to East Coast. It was like a normal activity that the family would do on a Saturday night. As usual, they would set up a tent and his mother would be busy preparing sandwiches and stuff. Whereas his father would go to the jetty to try his luck at fishing. He and his sister, Nana, 
would usually go rollerblading as they loved the cool morning breeze passing them as they played. However, that night the siblings were too tired, so much so that they didn't have the strength to do their normal rollerblading. All they wanted to do was sit in the tent and waste time. Out of boredom, Izard, who belongs to the video photography club at school, decided to take some photographs of the scenery of East Coast at night. He felt that it would be the only enjoyable thing to do other than sitting in the tent, which was so hot, it felt like it was barbecuing them alive. He searched his bag for his camera, which he would never leave home without. He is a very enthusiastic photographer, and he feels that he should be prepared, as great scenery and unbelievable expressions on people might turn up any time. He and his siblings had taken a few shots here and there. Izzard had a very strong feeling that the film of the camera would reveal his best work. He just couldn't wait to finish that film. Damn it, it's going to be the last shot. Hey Nana, give me the nicest pose you can give. Izzard said to his sister, who was a real, true beauty. And so Nana lied down on the pathway, posed just like any models would do. Izzard had a strong feeling about the next shot he intended to take. The bushes beside her and a little touch of moonlight on her face really brung out the beauty in her. Just as he was about to take a shot, the bushes rattled and a very strong gust of wind blew past. Izzard was shocked. Nana shouted at him, Hey, come on, it's getting cold out here. Take this last shot quick. Nana seemed shivery. Izzard was unsure whether he wanted to take the shot or not. He just felt uneasy. Could it be? He just tried to get it out of his mind. It's only the wind, he kept thinking to himself. Finally, he was ready to take the shot. Nana, get ready. Izzard behind you. Nana shouted before she ran away. Izzard, without much hesitation, turned around and what he saw freaked him out. During the long exchange of eye contact, Izzard had managed to click his last shot on what he saw. Amazingly, he was sure that the camera clicked a few times when it was supposed to be the last shot. After that, he fainted. When the film was developed, all his earlier shots were found to be not taken, and all the shots turned out to be last shot. And it is a very frightening picture. Hello watchers and listeners, thank you so much for watching. As always, a big thank you to all of the Reddit users who kindly allowed me to use their stories. If you want to help support this channel, you will find links to both my Patreon and my Teespring store in the description below. So feel free to have a look. And the biggest thank you to all of you who continue to support me. I truly do appreciate it. And remember, Papa loves you.